Welcome to the Lindsay Year Symposium. This is a symposium in which we're exploring the innovations and changes that were made during the years that John Lindsay was mayor of the city of New York from 1966 to 1973. And the challenges and efforts that he undertook in order to make New York a livable city in a time that was quite tumultuous in the New York and the national history. I want to welcome you to this program and to join the program that's in progress. The panel that we're about to start really focuses on the core set of issues, which is how do we get services delivered to the citizens of New York across the vast size of the city as it is with all the diversity um, that one can expect between high-rise buildings, low residential, almost suburban communities and parts of Queens, to emergency services, to just dealing with what's a perennially controversial set of services in terms of the fire department. Um, the panelists, um, from my personal point of view, each one of them has played an important part in my own personal life. Um, the first speaker who will, will talk, I'll introduce quickly the panel, and then I'll introduce the, the speakers. The very first person I met, I had been on the faculty at Princeton, got recruited to go from Princeton to um, the State University of New York, to go from the computer engineering department to uh, the start of a whole public policy program. And the very first person that the head of the program, a guy by the name of Bob Nathans, introduced me to was Steve Savis who at that point was in the city administrator's office as the deputy city administrator. And we came in to talk about urban problems. And I remember sitting outside of City Hall, which is where we met um, too many years ago, talking about the kinds of things that Steve thought were as important to be doing and talking about the whole way in which the city was approaching kind of organizing the delivery of services. Years later, after Steve had been at HUD and had been at Columbia on the faculty and came to Baruch, he kind of chaired a committee that recruited me to be the dean of the school. And some years later, in an effort to kind of get Steve recognition for his work, um, I was asked to explain why what Steve did was important. And I tried to make it very simple for people. I took a global map, and I colored in all of the countries for which one of Steve's books about privatization and organizing services uh, was published. And it covered, I think, 94% of the globe. Um, so Steve Savage has a lot to talk about in terms of services. In particular, when Steve came to the city, he focused a lot of his work on dealing with emergency ambulance services. Uh, Herb Ellish, who at the time that I got involved out of Stony, Stony Brook, was the sanitation commissioner. He had come from um, Washington and had served as the deputy EPA administrator several months before I had arrived at Stony Brook. And I have to say, probably one of the most influential people in my life about teaching me about some of the issues you have to be concerned about when you really do want to create change. Everything from the importance of giving an administrator a memo rather than a 25-page technical report to the issue of the importance of trying to be prepared to convert the idea that you want to implement as a change to really understand how that change affects everybody. And in the course of some of the things that we did, um, some of the changes that were critical to be addressed were just the question about what happens to people carpools on the one system versus another. And I think the skills that Herb acquired and kind of demonstrated as sanitation commissioner stood him very well over the years as he moved into private industry um, at U.S. Steel in Pittsburgh and headed the Carnegie Library, which I always thought was a kind of interesting job to have, and is currently the COO of the College Board. Peter Colasar. Um, I met Peter when both of us were too young to be uh, taught, taken too seriously. Peter was at the Rand Institute at the time, uh, and I, I do want to say a few things about the Rand Institute. It was the Rand Institute, Ed Blum, who headed the fire project, who actually introduced um, the people at Stony Brook and Bob Nathans, both to the city and to the Sanitation Commission. And it, the work that we did with sanitation was as a result of that introduction. He was going to lend us his team to help guide us neophytes. And I remember several meetings we had in Rand where we would argue back and forth over modeling approaches to how to deal with rescheduling the collection of garbage. So I think we've got people who are highly knowledgeable about the service or highly knowledgeable about the period. And the one thing I want to say about the Rand Institute is it's just interesting of the history of things. 
Most people may or may not remember that in, in, after, the first, after the Second World War, the U.S. government decided they needed to have a more scientific approach to warfare based on some of the things that came out of England. And so they commissioned a project through Douglas Aircraft, which was called the RAND Project, which came out with a report that talked about, and this was the late 40s, that talked about the issue of using spacecraft as a military weapon. And that strategic long-term thinking got a lot of people's attention, and out of that was created the RAND Corporation, whose initial funding came from the Ford Foundation. And the Ford Foundation and Paul Ilvesaka, who had come from Washington into New York to help put together an urban agenda, was one of the individuals who, when Fred Hayes was looking to bring analytical talent to New York, helped broker bringing the Ford, bringing the Rand Institute into New York and was instrumental in helping to create the Rand Institute. So I think we've got a panel of people who are both knowledgeable on the service delivery side, but who've also had a broader range of experiences. So with that introduction, let me turn the panel over to Steve Savas. Thank you very much. You know, uh, this morning we heard about the uh, Office of Management and Budget, or Bureau of the Budget, as it was called then, and the great work that was done then under, under Fred Hayes, who truly was an outstanding uh, public servant. But there was another part to the management operation in the city of New York. There's something called the city admin, the office of city, the office of administration, which is also part of the office of the mayor, and that was headed by someone with the title of deputy mayor and city administrator. It was Timothy Costello at the time. And I was first deputy city administrator, and a couple of people in the audience here, Sig Ginsburg and Eileen Berenyi, were also, Eileen Brettler at the time, were also in that office. They had colleagues of mine there. And we too were involved on a smaller scale, a less visible scale, but we also did some good things. Uh, in my opinion, the uh, greatest and most visible, permanent, worldwide innovation in public administration started in the Lindsay administration, although well, that's not widely recognized. Um, as, as originating there, and I'm referring to privatization, the deliberate introduction of competition uh, via the private sector, challenging complacent public monopolies. Ed Hamilton this morning talked about basically complacent public monopolies. Uh, and it's worth, I think it's worth reviewing how it started in the Lindsay administration. It all started on the famous Sunday, February 9th, 1969, the Lindsay snowstorm. He didn't cause the snow, but it was still called the Lindsay snowstorm, right? And uh, it, was, it was obviously a disaster from the, from the word go. And on Monday morning, I was asked to look at what happened and what should we do so it shouldn't happen again. And we undertook a project. Uh, Steve Rosenthal was on my staff. He's up at the uh, University of Boston University nowadays. And, he, uh, and we did a great project, which actually figured out what went wrong and how we should, we should revise the snow plan in order to work more effectively so we can mobilize more effectively, allocate resources more properly, dispatch better, and do some other things well. And we actually developed a snow plan, which for the first time uh, did have a logical way, for example, of giving priority to street, city street plowing. The original plan involved how to get out of the city during a nuclear attack. Those are streets that were first, had the highest priority for being plowed. We figured out that there was maybe a better way of doing it nowadays. <laughs> And I was pleased to learn just about as recently as five years ago that, that the plan that we devised then was still in effect as of five years ago. Well, we did that, but then I realized that during a snow emergency, the Department of Sanitation was actually out plowing only 50% of the time. And the rest of the time was spent on wash-up breaks, warm-up breaks, fueling breaks, and coffee breaks. So I says to myself, says, gee, if they're working only half the time during an emergency, I wonder what they're like in doing their regular work and it's not an emergency. And so we did some studies, and we found a number of interesting things. Uh, we found, for example, that the, uh, uh, the mafia was collecting garbage at $17 a ton. The Department of Sanitation was collecting garbage at $49 a ton. Okay. Uh, we also did a comparison looking at similar uh, parts in Queens and adjacent to Queens in Nassau County. There's a very, very similar community. And this community in Queens is, is, uh, has its garbage collected by a private carting firm, which is a New York City firm. And of course, the comparable uh, geographically, economically similar area just across the, the, the borderline in Queens was being done by the Department of Sanitation. Again, there's a huge difference in performance between the two. There was a higher service level, three times collection in Nassau versus only t uh, twice collection in, in, uh, in Queens, as I recall, uh, but it was still cheaper on the, on the Queens side, uh, the, on the Nassau side by the private firm. So we did some more studies, look at some other servers in the city, and we produced a recommendation to the mayor that we try an experiment. We take some districts in the city, 
uh, that are uh, homogeneous, divide them in half, have half done by the Department of Sanitation, half done under competitive conditions, selecting private firms to do the work, and let's see what happens after a year on that. Well, you would think that I was proposing a new revolution. There was a huge battle about that. Uh, Jerry Kretschmer, who was a sanitation commissioner at the time, was, uh, was out outraged. There was a front page headline in the, in the New York Post about that story, and, uh, and Kretschmer was fighting this tooth and nail, and his, his tactic was to go to the garage and say, guys, this guy Savs is full of fill in the blank, but guys, I need your help. He was trying to improve their productivity without, without doing this. Uh, but getting to the, uh, to the other thing about the, um, the kind of things that were actually ex executed, not only initiated here in the, uh, in the Lindsay administration, but actually executed, the first problem that hit me came in the following way. There was a, a serious automobile accident in Columbus Circle. Gay pressmen and a television crew happened to be there. They saw the accident or reported the accident. They called for an ambulance. They were filming away, and they waited for the ambulance to arrive. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And they waited for about 45 minutes, as I recall the uh, information at the time. And anyway, the mayor turned to the deputy mayor and said, do something to make the ambulance get there faster. The deputy mayor turns to me and said, do something to make the ambulance get there faster. I turned around, but there was nobody behind me at the time, right? Uh, but I just come from IBM, and so I turned to my former colleagues in IBM, one of whom, named Jeffrey Gordon, was the inventor of something called the Gordon Simulator, and the Gordon Simulator became, subsequently became GPSS, the General Purpose System Simulator, which was a standard software package for mathematical modeling used commercially for many, many years. It was an early example of that. So what do we do with that? By doing mathematical modeling and study, we looked at the effect of different dispatching policies, different assignment policies, different location policies. And it turns out you, you learn all sorts of interesting stuff when you do this, right? Uh, it turns out that until the Second World War, you always had a doctor riding on ambulances, OK? Well, during the Second World War, there was a, there was a uh, shortage of doctors. You no longer had doctors on ambulances. And yet the, the ambulances were, still were being stationed at the hospitals in order to, so doctors could get on readily. Now, this was you know, 20 years after the Second World War ended, and 30 years after, or 25 years after, we had no more doctors, but the ambulance was still stationed there. And we figured out that maybe the ambulance ought to be stationed where people are likely to be calling for ambulances, rather than some hospital which happens to be malallocated for that particular, or mallocated for that particular purpose. We reduced the average response time by 31% and we increased the fraction of calls reached within 10 minutes by 46%. You found all sorts of interesting things. For example, a lot of people call for an ambulance, and as the ambulance approached the hospital, they'd open the door and climb out of the ambulance. They were using the ambulance as a taxi service, all right? And it turns out that a lot of the calls were, it's amazing how people misuse public services. It turns out that a lot of the calls were really not necessary, and, and uh, both the ambulance technicians and at the hospitals, uh, many calls were found to be unnecessary. And so we tried something else. We tried using registered nurses answering the, the calls for ambulances. And the nurses would then say, well, why don't you just take the Band-Aid and pull that red string and apply the, the Band-Aid to your finger and you don't need an ambulance. Well, it turns out they were able to make a significant reduction in the number of calls, uh, number of ambulances dispatched by some simple stratagems of just making some inquiries. And if somebody demanded an ambulance, they would get it, OK? And because Mayor Lindsay was concerned that we'd be rejecting ambulances, you know, once in so often somebody would die from a rejected ambulance. But no, the protocol was clear. You ask some questions and see if you can deter people if they really need an ambulance or not. Uh, but if in, an in, a, in a pinch, in a, uh, the fail-safe case, by all means, send an ambulance. So we did that. Then it turns out that that work was too uh, sub-professional, even for registered nurses. It turns out that work could be done simply by experienced ambulance technicians. Uh, and that was being done. We also got rid of a situation where at 911, there was a huge, huge uh, banner across the room that said, un momento por favor, okay? Uh, it turns out that you had people asking for ambulances, and the people answering didn't know any Spanish, and so they'd say, un momento por favor. They push a number on the telephone, and you had a Spanish-speaking person there. But we improved that process, and in the course of it all, the, the ambulance service also got moved from the Department of Hospitals to HH, the Health and Hospitals Corporation. The dispatching was done differently, and the end result was, we think, lives saved and fewer ambulances used. Because it's amazing the kind of solutions that we needed to make the ambulance get there faster. Hospital commission, let's buy 100 more ambulances, and or let's pay more overtime and hire more, more nurses and more, more ambulance technicians. So there are all sorts of expensive ways of being suggested. 
but by better allocation of ambulances and better dispatching service and so on, we managed to improve the service. And I repeat, those are one of the earliest examples of uh, mathematical modeling and these gee whiz modern techniques being used in public services. And John Lindsay and uh, Met Deputy Mayor Timothy Costello deserve credit for the kind of changes that occurred then. Let me stop there and turn it over then to Herb Ellish. If I could just make one comment. Um, there was no 911 before That's right. Lindsay like became mayor. Yeah. Yeah. That is one of the innovations of the many that got instituted during that period. Herb. Well, I'm, I'm glad Steve wasn't successful quickly about <laughs> privatization of the sanitation department. I wouldn't be here to talk to you about, about what happened in that time. Uh, but given that this is a, a, a session about public management, is the title, I thought that I would uh, talk sort of briefly about uh, what happened in the sanitation department in the second Lindsay, Lindsay administration. It's kind of a case study, which from my point of view, about what it really takes to make uh, really substantial change, how complex it is, how many people have to be involved, how the stars all, all have to be aligned um, together, that everybody really believes change is, is necessary, uh, or else it really won't happen. And so let me, let me just uh, talk about that. Um, to, uh, to sort of set the stage, in, in uh, six, 1969 and 1970, when there was a poll of uh, the people about what they thought was the major problems in the, in the city, sanitation ranked either one or two, depending where you are, higher than problems of crime or not. There was garbage dumped on the Van Wick Expressway by people in demonstrations because fundamentally the garbage just wasn't getting picked up. Um, and the mayor was really um, uh, out there on sanitation. I mean, he had been clear that it was a very high priority for him. Um, he was public about it. He was sincere about it. He thought that if we're going to do public management, if we're really going to do something, we ought to be able to pick up the garbage, for example. But, and he, and a great deal was done, and which really set the stage for what we were able to do later. Um, in 1968, 1969, Dave would know, we essentially turned over the entire truck fleet. All new trucks came in. And the idea was more productivity, better maintenance, all the rest of it, it's going to work well. There was no more productivity. And there were, every day, somewhere between 35 and 50% of all the trucks out of service uh, depends who was counting. Fundamentally, nobody was counting, but it was about that percentage. New trucks, old trucks, fundamentally didn't matter. There was uh, a growing amount of garbage not being collected. The sanitation department said they missed 10% of the collections, but those were, uh, those were not reliable numbers. Fundamentally, they were behind on Monday morning. It got worse during the week. The streets got dirtier, and so it was it was a political problem as well as a real service problem. A lot of other things uh, were done. There were, um, I think probably this morning, you talked about uh, a lot of the management initiatives and the staff that were put in place by the, by the mayor. The, the project planning staff in the mayor's office put together a system, a plan, for how you ought to do vehicle maintenance how you need to have an inventory of, uh, of the trucks. For example, you ought to know how many you had and where they were, something as simple as that. When I got to be the sanitation commissioner, I think about the third week, I got to the office about 8 o'clock and the phone rang, and uh, the person on the phone said, I'd like to speak to the commissioner of sanitation. I said, that's me. He said, well, I'm Sergeant so-and-so at the Peekskill State Troopers Barracks. I said, <laughs> what is what is that about? And they said, well, we have one of your garbage trucks on a, on a street, the business district, the Peekskill. So I said, really? Well, just we'll get somebody up to get it, but just could you tell me the number on it? They're all numbered so you know what district they're in, where they're located, et cetera. And I, so I had somebody just call up that district and say, do they have all their trucks? I mean, how many do they have? What are they? Came back, all present and accounted for. 
<laughs> and, and they were telling the truth. They had no idea how many trucks there really were signs going on. It was really fundamentally, fundamentally that bad. Um, the, um, I remember also, it really came home to me about the third week of the, when I was, uh, had the job, I got a call from the mayor's office about four o'clock that the um, mayor wanted me to go along on one of his famous trips out to the neighborhoods, out to Bedford-Stuyvesant, basically because the garbage hadn't picked up, been picked up for three or four days. And he wanted me to go out and explain it to the people. But we went, I went out with him in, a, <laughs> in one of his rides, and we got out there, a lot of angry people. And he just walk, kept walking around and introduced me to everybody, <laughs> gave everybody my phone number, and said, he's going to get it all picked up. I tell you, something really concentrates the mind. That was it. Um, well, the fact is that um, three years later, maybe it should have been privatized, but in any event, three years later, uh, we were picking up all the garbage. There were zero miscollections. Uh, and there was, there were about, on an average day, about seven to eight percent of the trucks were in maintenance. We, we knew where they were, they were in control, there was a system put in place. And Jerry Kretschmer and I got a lot of credit for it, et cetera, et cetera. But th there was so much behind what happened, I'd just like to talk about all the elements that, that went, that went into it. Um, the, um, and this thing about no night collections, we had, you know, there were a lot of garbage was collected at night in the 60s because they were trying to catch up. And that was when they got some trucks fixed and they went out at night. About early in my career there, about 3 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, and it was a very nice man on the other end of the phone. It said, uh, are you the commissioner of sanitation? I said, yes. He said, would you like to hear what a garbage truck sounds like at 3 o'clock in the morning? I said, not particularly, but then he had held the phone out. I heard it, and he said, did you hear that? I said, yes. He's hung up. So I understood. It's really very, it was really bad. So we, we and you also can't manage people when they're running around the streets in trucks at night. The, um, but when we got into this uh, job, Jerry and I got into it, a real foundation had been laid. In addition to that, the, the city, I thought it was pretty courageous, had hired McKinsey and Company to come in and do a lot of management consulting work. They came into the sanitation department and put together a, a collection system for the garbage. I mean, collecting garbage is sort of like running a factory. I've run a lot of factories since then. It's a production system, and there needs to be a system in place of goals, have the roots right, know where the people are at all times, know how much is collected, change the roots at all times so that while people work a larger percentage of the day than Steve had found in the study in the couple of years earlier. I don't know if it was that bad, but it was probably pretty close to being accurate. Um, and so they came in to do that. We had the Stony Brook efforts really helpful. There was all of this analysis, and for the first time, we had, any, we had facts. I mean, when you try to manage something, the, 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 the mark of really an unmanaged place, someone characterized it to me as chaos when we got there, and I think that's pretty accurate. Characteristics, there's no information. It was sort of made up every day, and that was what the reports were. So we had the, the foundation going forward. But um, the strands to being successful to, from uh, our point of view were getting those systems installed and getting them, uh, getting that done. Now, they, getting the management job of it and changing people's habits and making sure people should take us seriously was not easy because uh, earlier on, the union had very substantial management uh, powers in the, in the uh, in the place. I mean, it, it, it kind of, there was an accretion of it. Earlier, uh, essentially, all major appointments, promotions, were not made by the union, but sort of cleared with John Delury. Um, and so I told, I, I, I told uh, this story last night, actually. I, we figured, I figured that if we had any chance to be successful, we needed to do this. We needed to take control of it and become the managers and not do this anymore. I also knew I didn't have enough courage to, to just um, 
to call John Delury and say, this is what I was going to do, because you know the conversation was bound to be really unpleasant if I wasn't going to listen to what his suggestion was. So on a very, very significant appointment pretty early, I, um, I made the appointment, called the person in, told him he had the job. And then when he left, I called John Delury as a matter of courtesy to say, we have this coming along, and this is really important, and I, I've, this is the person I, that I'm going to promote. And he said, well, he's really a good candidate, but it, there are a few other people I'd like to suggest. <laughs> so I said, well, it's too late, and because um, I've already done it. And well, I won't repeat all of the language. It was a really language and hung up. And the problem in those situations is that he could have stopped really collecting the garbage. I mean, he could have slowed the, tro the troops down in a way, never knew it. But the fact is, he really wanted to change as much as the mayor did. His people were being criticized every day. He was having a difficulty. He was going to labor negotiations. His ability to get a good contract was being compromised. So while we, so there was sort of a dance going on with, with him with respect to that. So one of the things that was important, not only the mayor was insistent on a change, but the union was really fundamentally very cooperative. There were issues on a daily basis, but basically they were more than acquiescent in the substantial change that was going on. To me, the most important thing about uh, what happened and what is important in any organization, and in public management in particular, is the need to capture the people and make the change theirs. They need to own the change. Now, we had a situation where sanitation workers were people uh, who were, many of them were ashamed of what they did. They would drive through the streets in the trucks, and they weren't collecting the garbage. The streets were dirty. People would yell at them. I know of examples where men would wear suits leaving home at uh, day because they didn't want to tell their families what they did, and then they would change into their clothes when they got to the garages. And so as we went forward, we began to, and, and, and the changes started to happen. And productivity really started to increase. And there were good newspaper articles. There was a momentum created that created pride. And they began to really own all these changes. In fact, the productivity teams we had out there were run by the sanitation people. We had advisors from the outside. But the people, it became their efforts going forward and um, one day, as a matter of fact, I'll just tell this last story. We were, you know, the, the newspapers reporting the productivity was going up by half a ton and a, this ton, and every month it was going up. And one month, it went down. It was in the summer by two-tenths of a percent or something. I got a call from the leader of this group, and he said, Commissioner, we let you down. I said, what's the matter? He said, productivity got, went down. Well, I said, well, come on down and tell me about it. What happened? He said, well, the problem is that, you know, we have these roots and we couldn't change them fast enough. The problem is it's the summertime and just people are away and they're not putting out as much garbage. <laughs> he said, if we could figure out a way to get them to put out more garbage <laughs> until we just till we could get these roots changed and lengthened a little bit, we could get this productivity number up. So then I realized we had an issue with what the goals were. I was a little bit worried about what goals we set. But they became the owners of all this. And to me, what's really important in public management more than anybody else, it's easy, it's easy to criticize the workers. And it's never the workers' fault. So it's some of them, their fault. It's management. It's lack of systems. It's a lack of, of just managing. People, people will fundamentally uh, do what you ask them to do. And really, they want to do the right thing, by and large. I mean, we never, we made a lot of changes in management, never did it publicly, never announced it, never criticized them. We spent a lot of time trying to get recognition and rewards and the mayor coming and giving them awards and all of that stuff to move forward. So that was really important. Uh, 
going forward. So all in all, it was all of the work that was done throughout the entire government, all the new people that came in, plus the coming together of felt need and the ability to just move it to a new place. So that's a short form of what happened. Peter, you want to tell us about sure. the stuff that went on in the fire department? Sure. Hello. Um, it's really nice to follow to follow her because, um, in particular, and Steve has been a colleague of mine at Columbia, but her made a point that I think is absolutely most critical: is um, it takes people like Herb to get this stuff done, regardless of the quality of the analysis and the thought, the leadership is abs absolutely essential. And uh, we, as we look at efforts in the uh, Lindsay years to make transformations in agency after agency, you can mark out the small number of agencies in which the changes are really effective by the character of, uh, of, of a leadership. And so, a point that I think I'll come back to. So I am uh, Peter Colasar, and I'm actually from Columbia University. I'm semi-retired, but I'm a professor in engineering and business. And back in the day, 1968, 1975, I was a member of the New York City Rand Institute. And so I'm going to talk from that perspective of my experience at Rand. As a, and I was a real techie then. I was not not a leader of anything. I was a hardcore uh, analyst working most particularly on the fire project, which was allegedly the most successful of the projects, but also quite a bit for the police department, uh, and maybe make some comparisons between the police and fire projects, because one was quite successful and the other not, and I, I want to speculate about what some of the uh, reasons are. So as uh, some of you, I think most of you know, the Rand Institute was a, a kind of unique partnership. There's a structural aspect of this is an important part of the story, in that it was a partnership between the infamous or famous Rand Corporation of Santa Monica, this uh, war th warrior think tank, and the New York City government. That was neither a research institute nor consulting corporation, but something that was a, a kind of mixture of the two, in that uh, the goal was to attack some immediate pressing city problems, but lay a foundation through research for, for longer term efforts. And uh, this unique establishment of having a dedicated professionals with both a long run and short run view and with a patience on the part of the city to make an investment in this over a multi-year uh, time period was unique. I think one of the telling aspects that contributed to our success when we had that, in the instances when we had success. So I'm going to talk mostly about, um, about fire. And I should lay a kind of perspective of um, what was it like back in that day. Fire alarms had more than doubled in the five years preceding our arrival on the scene. The busiest fire companies in the city were responding over 8,000 alarms a year. That's more than one per hour, 24-7, 365. You can imagine what that, what that workload is like. At the same time, over those five years, the resources of the fire department had hardly increased at all. 1967, the year before the Rand Institute was founded, the fire department bought its first computer. It was quite a time. So uh, let me say in the kind of uh, summary capsule form here, what was it that this RAND team, which were particularly operations research folks, people like myself, applied mathematicians and statisticians uh, did? And let's tick them off and come back to the ones that are more important uh, later and maybe in the, in the question uh, period. First, we reorganized in simple ways, non-technical ways, the dispatching office. You're trying to get engines and ladders to fires faster. The union suggestion was more engines and more ladders. 
but by simply reorganizing the work processes along the lines that, that Steve articulated when he opened up here, in the dispatching office yourself, you had the impact in the dispatching office by spending almost no money at all of the addition of 50 or 60 fire companies in, in the city. So that was, that was job number one. And what was interesting was that the city thought the fire department thought and the RAND people thought before we started that what we needed was the big computer in the sky to handle dispatching, and that wasn't the case at all. All you needed to do is reorganize the workflow in, in the offices. Second, innovation. The introduction of part-time fire companies. The traditional fire company works 24 hours a day. And it made sense in the old days, but the alarm rates peak in the early evening hours and in, into, say, 1 o'clock in the morning and then drop precipitously. Simple idea, similar, similar to the fourth platoon idea, similar to some of the scheduling ideas in sanitation, was to have fire companies on duty when you needed the most. So we introduced the idea of what we call tactical control companies, manned only for a 12-hour tour, matching the demand peak. The union, those companies lasted for about seven months until the union encouraged the firemen working on those companies to uh, decline uh, f f further assignment. So it was a, that was a, an effective but short-term strategy. Third, the introduction of the idea of adaptive response and that the standard response of the fire department was for any alarm Anywhere in the city, any time of day, you send three engines and two ladders. Or you try to, whether you have them or not. So the brand style of analysis was to try to predict the possibility that this alarm that comes in now is a serious alarm as opposed to a false alarm. And over half the alarms were false alarms. And to make a calculation of the possibility of another serious alarm coming maybe down the block in the next five or 10 minutes. And so key the dispatch to the severity, to the projected probabilistic severity of the alarms coming in. An elegant idea, one that we love from the mathematical viewpoint, but one that was only effective in certain neighborhoods at certain times. So sometimes the mathematicians go for the, um, for the veins rather than for the, for the jugular. Fourth, one I was mostly uh, involved with, the introduction of the first real-time decision support system, a relocation algorithm, which relocated fire engines throughout the city to rebalance fire protection. In those instances, when there was one or more large fires burning simultaneously, and some neighborhoods we left unprotected. So you need to really shuffle the fire, en fire engines around. That system, which we designed to handle moderate conflagrations in its source, actually was used to great effect during the September 11th attack on the World Trade Center in which half the fire engines in the whole city were, were, were occupied at the World Trade Center. That system, which we designed in 1975, is still in operation today on a daily basis. The next, perhaps most important, most Im impactful, and interesting uh, aspect of research, was the development of several models for what I'll call, quote unquote, the optimal allocation of fire companies to regions of the city. And these models enabled the FDNY to better understand the implications and trade-offs associated with adding or eliminating companies. The models were first employed by the Lindsay administration in 1972, then again in 1975, and have been employed several times by the Bloomberg administration when the fire department has been put under fiscal stress and had to consider temporarily or permanently uh, closing or, or moving fire companies. Interesting aspect of this piece of research is that it was never on the research agenda. It was never on the research agenda. It was directly a consequence of a long-term view which permitted someone like me to sit in a room surrounded with maps indicating where fires were, where fire engines were, and start to think, wait a second, maybe there's a fundamental mathematical relationship here that could be used to understand the problem better. Fire department never asked for it. 
They never thought they were paying for it. It happened as a kind of fringe benefit and turned out to be the most impactful of all the, of all the things that we did. And then, of course, our project had a big impact in the long run on the thinking in the department and its, and its analytic capability. And we established, as researchers, a really a new field of operations research, emergency service system deployment, mm -hmm. which has had an impact for, certainly beyond New York City, beyond fire, into police, ambulances, and Steve's initial uh, work was one of the seminal papers on all of that. So, so a, a kind of... A bigger, bigger impact. Many cities around the United States impacted here. Let me give a few comments. I don't want to go too, on too long. About some characteristics um, of this project that made it successful, in my, in my judgment. And the first one on my list, looking at Herb again, is leadership. The leadership of the fire department, particularly its commissioner, John T. O'Hagan, who was an uneducated man he was not really a high school graduate, but a visionary leader and dedicated to change. And he saw this skyrocketing alarms thing was absolutely, absolutely essential. And that he did not have a big staff infrastructure at the time. So it was rather easy for the RAND group to work directly with O'Hagan and his staff. Second, the problem. The problems faced by the FDNY, and I would say sanitation in many ways, are made to order for people like me, for the engineers. You've got lots of stuff happening. Fire engines moving all around, the alarms coming in, the garbage piling up and all that. There's, either there is really, in fact, or there's the potential for lots of data, lots of analysis, lots of stability, and mathematical models are appropriate to those kinds of problems. We were lucky to have the right kind of problem. With the right leadership, we had the right kind of problem. In addition, and I don't want to be self-serving on this, I'm talking about the researchers. That RAND team is an extraordinarily talented group of mathematicians and analysts that I'm very, very proud to have been a, a member of. And they had a style of working that was unique. We, they were not. We were not looking at these things from an academic viewpoint. Step number one was not to formulate a mathematical model. It was to get out and ride on the fire trucks, spend hours in dispatching offices, read hundreds of reports about fatal fires. It's short to kind of internalize ourselves what the, what the actual problems were. And then as I mentioned, uh, I mean, in the beginning here, the project architecture in that the RAND project was simultaneously a fully engaged consulting enterprise and a long-term long -term research establishment. So while we could gain immediate credibility with John O'Hagan by doing simple things in the dispatching office, back of the envelope calculations, they gave us free reign to invest in longer term research that, that eventually paid off. And then, I guess, um, the last of the points I'd like to make about uh, success was the sense of crisis. O'Hagan knew, the department knew, even the union knew that something had to change. So we came along at the right time with uh, some solutions that made the problems a little bit better. And as I look at other engagements, which I've been in, we were involved in at RAND or in the rest of my career, and, and I, I tend to work in the, in the private sector rather than the public sector, I think this is not a bad checklist to go down uh, and if you're lacking on the points that I've spoken to, you've got the possibility of a project that's perhaps not going to pay off so well. Uh, let, let me make, um, I think, an, a, an observation. You heard Peter describe putting in the tactical control units, and then after seven months, the volunteers were ordered out by the union. Well, you might ask the question, why in the world did you do volunteers? Why didn't you just restructure the, the system by which people got deployed? Well, the state legislature, by law, mandates that there are three, I guess, 24 hours round the clock. I mean, it's in law. And if you want to change it, just like the issue of the 4th platoon in the police department, you've got to get the legislature to change it. And the 4th platoon only was changed in part because there was a huge scandal of, co of cooping 
where the, I guess the Daily News had a big photograph of the Times, I don't remember which paper, about cops falling, being asleep in their car in Central Park. The sanitation department didn't have that problem in terms of there was nothing in law, it was really in practice. And so the issue was, as I discovered on a conference call for a national organization yesterday, sometimes practice becomes almost like law. And it's really about people being willing to do the right thing. Um, given the hour, I think I'd like to take questions from the audience. Um, this question is stimulated by your story about the uh, sudden drop in dropping productivity. And it suddenly in the summertime, people weren't putting out enough garbage. And the comment you made was, uh, we have to really like, examine our goals. And it, uh, this question is going to seem a little odd for a situation which almost all of which have been described are situations of almost desperate crisis not being able to pick up enough garbage, the most basic, to get it picked up and try to do it as efficiently as possible or put out fires and answer alarms as efficiently as possible. Uh, in education, some of us have begun to think about, wait a minute, what's our goal? It's learning, not just services. And I've been told by other management people, oh, there's thinking like that going on with regard to a lot of other services. With regard to sanitation, for instance, uh, you said, one of, one of you said to talk about the story of people throwing garbage on the Van Wyck Expressway, and that was because the garbage wasn't being picked up. So, the, you know, let's get the garbage picked up. Assumably, if it's all picked up, they won't throw in the garbage on the expressway. But on my street, kids will go by every day, eating their food and throwing their papers all over the street. So if what you really want is a clean city, it's not just a question of picking up the garbage, but how do we get the whole citizenry to conduct themselves in a way in which the city is kept cleaner. And if it's fires, how do we get people from letting, setting fires or keeping their thing? So the whole idea of prevention, in other words, which is certainly a major term that's come into social services, they say something comparable to that is being talked about in these other services. The productivity isn't just doing the services in the most efficient way, but how to get the ultimate goal of clean cities, fireless neighborhoods, and uh, crimeless streets accomplished partly by services, but by partly by mobilizing the whole community and changing their behavior so that they don't require so many services. Feeding back into Ms. Fuchs' point, somehow or other we've been increasing the need for services are coming. How do we possibly reduce the need for services by getting changes in the culture? Now, that's not your job. You're hired to put out fires and whatnot. But I'm just wondering in terms of management, well, and this thing's well, well, ac well, actually, it, it was really right. part of the job. Right. I mean, it's sort of a changing the whole culture wasn't really part of it. But there, there's a lot of evidence, for example, that if streets are clean, they'll stay clean. Right. That streets, if well, streets are dirty and not you know. the services aren't provided, people won't fundamentally pay attention. So part of the cleaning keeps it clean. There were... We had a lot of other issues of exhortation, recycling efforts, all of that, which were pretty unsuccessful back there in the 70s, frankly. But so there, it was it was part of the effort. But the the first effort was really take care of the, what was really a crisis, a fundamental problem. David, please. Look. And we reduced the, in the case of ambulances. I described how we tried to reduce the immediate demand by reducing calls. And that was an explicit strategy of mine. Can we reduce the demand? We didn't go back to improving health care fundamentally, but can you reduce the demand when we saw there were so many unnecessary calls? Peter, what was done in terms of the false alarm? Do you remember? Yeah, I, uh, one... One uh, eventual solution to the false alarms was the boxes. elimination of the alarm boxes, so that uh, New York City has archaic alarm boxes and it made it easy uh, to send in these anonymous malicious false alarms. So uh, that, that was one ameliorating factor. The other is the change, something we didn't talk about, but the depressing social conditions in the city at that time. We're talking about the 1968, 1969, the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, uh, fires, uh, in conflagration. Uh, so that was all really part of the times. And mercifully, th those conditions have largely changed. But, but to your point, by, by the way, you know, I, what I do teach is I do teach kind of systems analysis, process improvement. And the fundamental strategy is look at the demand for that service and try to manipulate it, control it, reduce it, reschedule it is one of the one of the fundamental tactics that you have, and not necessarily to fall into the trap of more, because you can always improve services by adding more, the capability. We tend to want to look at those other alternatives. 
Uh, hi, I'm Ralph Blumenthal. I was with the New York Times for many years, and I think I covered many of your innovations at the time. I'm now uh, at Baruch teaching journalism and uh, do, doing some research in the archives. Uh, many of your innovations, all of your innovations, obviously were accomplished in the pre-computer era. Um, and uh, I suppose you used slide rules or whatever you had at your disposal than <laughs> state of the art. Um, how different would your innovations be today given the tools that you have in terms of com computer analysis, uh, et cetera? Well, what I described, the fact, was the use of mathematical models on digital computers. So they were in use then at the time, uh, even though the city, uh, as, as Peter described, the city, the fire department bought its first computer in 1968. Uh, to, to, to show you how far behind the system was, I was hired from IBM, and I discovered that there were four uh, titles, computer titles in New York City. There was Key Punch Operator Dash Numeric Dash IBM, Key Punch Operator Dash Numeric Dash Univac, Key Punch Operator Dash Alphabetic Dash Univac, and Key Punch Operator Dash Alphabetic Dash Univac. And it took only two years for me to arrange for, for merging those five, those four titles. And by the way, the ones who had to deal with 26 keys got $5 a week more than the ones who had to deal with only 10 keys. So that was the situation of the city in 1967 when I got there. Uh, some of the analysis that was done was really pretty sophisticated and was did use the computer. I mean, the, uh, the chart day analysis, which was the same thing as in the fire department, yeah. which was to the assignments of all the sanitation men were the same every day of the week. Unfortunately, people didn't put out the garbage quite that in the even, so that caused the problem. And there was a very sophisticated analysis done by uh, Jerry Meckling and, and others, which was sophisticated enough so that it could be introduced in the labor negotiations. So the union would say, well, that's interesting, but we need this. And they could deal in the algorithm by providing what the union needed while preserving the benefits of the change. And so we were able to achieve a, a change from the negotiations about it. So I think that was fundamentally the, the um, the questions of um, how you tracked all the vehicles and the work was being done, it, I think we probably wouldn't have had an army of people collecting the information and writing it all down and doing all that, but I'm not sure that we needed anything a hell of a lot more sophisticated in terms of analysis to, to make the change. You know, every one of your laptops, the, the smallest, cheapest, simplest of those laptops, has a power that far exceeds all the computing power that existed in New York City, not, not, not the city government, in New York City, and all, all the research institutions at that time. And the, the program that almost all of you use from time to time, Excel, has the ability to manipulate data far beyond anything that we had with the smartest computer science people and statisticians at the Rand Corporation in those days, so that I can give a homework assignment to my students, as I do, with 73 years of daily data of water flows and reservoir levels uh, in the New York City water system as a homework assignment to do an, assi an analysis that's as sophisticated as anything the professionals would have done in those days. So what it does is bring to everyone, to every government agency, regardless of their function, the capability of, if not modeling, at least analysis, of knowing what's happening at all times. Yeah, I think it's a, revolutionary. Yeah, I think a good example of that is what goes on in the police department with the ability to really continually process almost in real time data and take to look at where they really need to kind of deploy police. And that's the kind of stuff that it was very hard and complicated, and you could estimate, and then it would change, but you couldn't change quick enough. Well, I've heard uh, if you that could, there's actually, I'm not sure this is right, but somebody tell me, there's GPS equipment in the sanitation yep. trucks today, so you could know where everybody is, and that's a big change. I mean, we actually had, um, wasn't publicized partway through, we had uh, squads of sanitation officers, we had a dozen or 15 assigned who drive the streets trying to find people who decided not to work. I, this, the current technology would make it a hell of a lot better. Yeah, if you would go to the mic. When I got my cell phone from Verizon, one of the features I discovered I could get since my daughter was on my same plan was I could track her phone. So for a nominal fee, if I was concerned where my daughter was from school, 
um, I could simply call on my phone into a, uh, a web-based number, and it would give me a map to show me where she was. I wouldn't have to wait for a call from Poughkeepsie. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Dan Bergfeld. I worked on the uh, civilianization project in the police department under Pat Murphy. And maybe I could address this question to Mr. Colsar. Could you tell us or share with us some of the challenges that Rand faced in dealing with the police department on various projects, and perhaps what some of the constraints were that made those projects less effective than you might have hoped? I've uh, come back to the leadership, leadership issue and challenges. The, the police department was also a department in a state of crisis, but the crisis was driven by other factors. It was, it was, it was driven largely by the problems of the Civilian Complaint Review Board and the, um, and the corruption scandal, so that the, the attention of the commissioners that we dealt with was not on the issues that we were competent to deal with, which were basically, basically deployment issues. So we were, I would say, working on, with, with police, working on the wrong problems. They, they weren't, weren't the central problems. And then eventually, we worked on, uh, the key problem that we, that we did succeed on was the, I'll call it the macro allocation of police forces. That basic question is, you've got 70, 70 or 72. 78, 78 precincts. Se uh, 78 then. precincts now and you've got uh, 10,000 officers are gonna be in the street this afternoon. Where should they be in which of those precincts? Eventually, we got to a model that has assisted the police department to do that, but it took four years to get there with the project being on and off and on and off and on and off, and essentially almost all of the characteristics that I went through that delineated the success of the fire project were to a greater or lesser extent missing with regard to police. And one other factor I have to say is this. Uh, there are policemen and firemen often in the same family. They're kind of different birds. Firemen, the fire department, basically follows its own rules. There are kind of rules of the road. They're laid out. The department and the officers and the rank and file men do it in responding to the fires. And therefore, those processes are not so hard to manage not so hard to control. This morning, one of the other speakers was speaking to the issue of the control in the police department. It's a command and control system. But the officers on the street, and particularly the sergeants, exactly. admittedly, sergeants do not function in the managerial capability that they ought to. So you're dealing with building mathematical models and optimization of a system that doesn't even operate nominally the way it's supposed to operate. And that's a... Uh, kind of yeah, I might take issue with you on, Excuse the, me. on uh, the police, uh, on the neighborhood patrols, and I think there was, at least in the 2-4 precinct, there were some very, very fine sergeants, uh, but when I left the 2-4, we were still doing uh, pin map tracking of different kinds of crime at different times of day, so uh, just supporting what you were saying earlier. Thank you. This is the conclusion of this segment of the Lindsay Year Symposium in which we've been looking at innovations that were introduced into the operation of New York City government from 1966 to 1973. This symposium is being held at Baruch College and I look forward to seeing you when we return for the next installment of this symposium.